I guess to introduce a lesson like this, just ask the question, what are you afraid of losing? What, what is it that you fear you will lose if you serve God? <sighs> Thank you, buddy. <laughs> it's good to have a living, breathing conscience. <laughs> oh. uh, one of these, I'm, no, I'm not going to say that. One of these days I can be trained. I doubt it. I doubt it very seriously. I keep thinking about this because when, when I do something wrong or, or when, I, when I give in to a fear of some kind, it always comes back to haunt me because I, I question what I know in the Bible, what I, how I put it all together, what is it that I learn from what I read. Because I read about stories like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now this was a very real, real danger that they were facing. It's not unheard of that we could face something very similar in our lifetimes. I know that there are places in the world right now where you can lose your life for being a Christian. Just admit that you are and it could cost you your life. So how is it that men like these three right here that Dan read about, how they could face that danger, I don't want to say without being afraid because I don't think that's possible, but at least face it with the kind of fortitude that they did not give in to their fear. And I ask myself, what are you afraid of losing, Daryl? What is it that will make you turn against God? What, what fear is there that's strong enough that would make you turn against God? Or at least deny what you believe? And I... I I've, went to the New Testament to read in the New Testament. I want to read you just a couple of things, okay? In Mark chapter 6 and verse 33, we have a story that's told both in Matthew and uh, here as well, and, and it, tells, it gives two instances in Matthew in chapter 14 and chapter 15 about Jesus feeding thousands of people, and, and I want to just read this, and then we'll take a look at how this affected the disciples. Verse 33, it says, The people saw them going, and many recognized them, and ran there together on foot from all the cities, and got there ahead of them. The Lord Jesus was in a boat. They could see the boat going, but the people were faster on land, and they went to where they thought he was going. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. People followed Jesus all the time. And I, I wonder, was it because he fed them so much that they followed him? Was it because they really wanted to learn... What Jesus said, he would say, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, he was really giving them insight into what the law of Moses always had been telling them, but they didn't understand. Verse 35, it says, when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. <laughs> you know, I, I, I look at the difference between the Lord and his disciples. They're, they're saying, get these people out of here so they won't take what we've got. I, I don't know whether that's what they were thinking or not, but, you know, the disciples carried stuff with them. 
always they carried their stuff with them. Uh, Judas had the money bag, and, and when they'd go into a town, they'd either have to get a place to stay or a place to eat, and Judas was the one that hold, held the money. And they'd always have enough to do whatever it was they wanted to do, but the disciples are they are kind of worried about all these people. I don't know whether they were worried about them infringing on their, uh, what they had or not, but it says, he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? You know, a denarii was a day's wage. Should we go spend 200 days wages? Now, how, if, if that's $100 a day, $200, $100, that's a lot of money. Should we just go buy bread, as much bread as we can buy, uh, to feed these people? They said to them, how many loaves? How many loaves do you have? Go look. When they went and found out, they said five and two fish. We've got five loaves and we've got two fish here. He commanded them all to sit down in groups, by groups on the green grass. They sat down in the groups of hundreds and fifties, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. He divided up the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. You know, this reminds me of something in the Old Testament, of Elisha and the the jar of oil and the bowl of flour that he said to the woman, go, I need some bread. I need something to drink. And she said, I, I was just about to go and make a loaf for me and my son and die because it's all we've got. He said, trust me, go and make me some first and then I'll make sure you have plenty. And then it's when the oil never ran out and the flour never ran out. And she just kept feeding the him and her and her son and uh, never ran out. Well, Jesus takes five loaves. I don't know how big they were. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> five loaves and two fish. He had this combination of seven food here. And he gives it to the disciples breaks it up and gives it to the disciples and keeps feeding. It says there were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. 5,000 men. I don't know how many people. They had a habit of counting men and not counting the women and children. What if there, there may have been 20,000 people there? And Jesus fed every one of them with five loaves and two fish. Now, what does that tell you? What should it tell anybody? In verse 43, though, it's uh, verse 42, it says, They all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces. They picked up more than they started with. I'm trying to wrap my brain around this. But these are the same men now, the same men that here in, next, in the next verse are going to show something. Let me read here. It says, And immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. I just fed them. Now I'm going to send them home. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. He went up on the mountain and spent a few minutes praying. When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land and seeing them straining at the oars for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night this is just before morning he came to them walking on the sea and intended to pass by them <laughs> this is the lord had a sense of humor <laughs> they left him back here and they're going to get there and he's over here now <laughs> The Lord's just going to walk right on by the boat on the water that's doing all kinds of 
uh, shenanigans. But somebody sees him. It says, But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out, For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke with them and said, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. I would ask the question, what were they afraid of losing right here? What were they afraid was going to happen to them? Then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped and they were utterly astonished. They had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. I've wondered if this was just a natural course of events. You know that they didn't learn anything from that first one? I want you to turn over to Matthew and let's read the account there, or read portions of it. In Matthew 14, we have this. Matthew 14, in verse 13, it tells this story, the same story that we just read there. It says, Now when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there to, in a boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of it, they followed him on foot from the cities. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate. We've already read that before. Same thing, he takes the loaves and he breaks the loaves, the five loaves and the two fish, and he gives them something to eat. And then it says, And they were all satisfied, down in verse 20, and they picked up what was left over, the broken pieces, twelve full baskets. So the same story. There were about 5,000 men who ate, besides women and children, Maybe 20,000 people. Then when comes the walking on the water in verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain to pray, same thing as before. But the boat was already a long distance from land and battered by the waves for the wind was contrary And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And the disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were terrified. It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke with them, saying, Take courage. Come on now. Take courage. It's I. Don't be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me that I should come to you on the water. He said, Come. Come on. I've always wondered if the Lord waited for all these things to happen before he picked Peter to be the one that was going to speak and and do whatever was done on the day of Pentecost, or was that something that the Lord already knew ahead of time? But notice who it is every time that jumps out there and does something. It's Peter, this, this impetuous person that claims to have all this faith claims to never be one that would ever deny him. He says, he said, come, come on. Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I want to ask the question. Did he actually believe that he was the Son of God? Did he actually believe that Jesus had turned water into wine? Did he actually believe that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead? All of these things were taking place in their lives. And it seems like the apostles were able to watch these things and not remember them when the time came that they were needed. What was he afraid of losing right here? His life? You go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know what they told the king? They were in a position furnished them by God. 
God put them in this spot. Let me kind of give you a little bit of background if you don't know the background of this. The southern kingdom had lasted a little over a hundred years longer than the northern kingdom. It was taken away into Assyrian captivity in, five, in uh, uh, 532 or 732 B.C. A little over a hundred years later, the southern kingdom was taken into captivity by Babylon this time. Now what had happened was that all of the rich young rulers, all of the royal seed were taken by Nebuchadnezzar and they were taken to Babylon in a different condition than the rest of the people. The people were taken as slaves. Some of the prophets were taken as slaves. Ezekiel was taken with those poor people out in the field and Ezekiel wrote from out there where people were suffering. Daniel, though, and... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's the names of these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were in the king's house. They were eating the king's food. They were living in luxury while their brethren were out there suffering. But it wasn't just uh, lopsided. They were there for a reason because God had put them there the same way he had put Joseph in the house of Pharaoh because from there he could do a lot of good for his people. From the king's palace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel could do a lot of good for their people when the time came. So God put them in that position. But he also put them in a position of being tested. Because nobody liked to have these servants in positions over them. So some of the Babylonians were really jealous about these three guys being in positions of authority. So they were trying to find ways that they could get them taken down from their lofty positions. Because you don't deserve that. We belong here. You're interlopers from outside. So all this was a setup. All this was something that was done by the rulers that were being supplanted by God's men in the palace. So they talked the king into this great statue. They talked the king into having this rule that if anybody bows down to anything other than or does not bow down to your statue when they hear the the gong and the cymbals and the music, then they're going to have to be punished for that. And they knew, they absolutely knew that these Jews would not bow, would not bow to a false statue of of a pretend God. So they had the king agree. They made sure that the king agreed that if anybody doesn't bow down to this statue, you're going to do them in, right? Right, king? And he agreed. So they were all watching. They were all waiting whenever the music sounded and it was time for the whole nation to bow down and worship this image of Nebuchadnezzar. And there were four people who didn't do it. They didn't see Daniel. But they did see Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so when they found them, they brought them before the king. And it's the last thing in the world the king wants to do is kill these guys because they're the the best that he's got. They're the most faithful, the most loyal. They're the ones that never cheat. They're the ones that do the right thing. But what am I going to do? I agreed to this law. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say to the king, do what you want to do. We don't have to give you an answer for this because the God we serve is not like that statue. That statue can't do anything for anybody. I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. That statue can't help anybody but our God whom we serve is able to save us from that furnace of fire. 
But even if he does not, he'll rescue us from your hand. You got to have a kind of a much different view of things to consider dying as a rescue. I've never liked the kind of rescue operation where the hostages die. (laughs) That doesn't seem to be success. But they understood something that the disciples right here do not understand yet. And that is that the Lord that they're following, the Lord that they see walking out on that water, that Lord is able to raise the dead. He raised Lazarus. That Lord is able to turn water into wine. That Lord has power over the demons because he can say, get out of there. And they fly away. So I wonder, what were they afraid of losing? What are we afraid of losing? When we allow problems in life to turn us against our God, when we allow an insult or or a, a problem between brethren, when we allow something that someone has done to get us to stop, following our God. I've had people say to me, I'm not going to that place. There's hypocrites in there. Yeah. Just about every one of us at one time or another are hypocrites. The best man, the best man we can even write about or read about in the New Testament, Barnabas, was caught up in that hypocrisy. It happens from time to time because we're human beings. Because we've got a fear of something that causes us to do something we shouldn't be doing. A fear that we're going to be rejected by somebody somewhere at some time causes us to do things that we know are wrong. Let's look at the real picture. Let's understand that the worst thing that could happen to these men right here in this boat would be for that boat to be flipped over. Did I say the worst thing? Is that what I said, the worst thing that could happen? Let me me look at that for a second. These men are going to spend the rest of their lives toiling and being tortured for the cause of Christ. They're going to be beaten. They're going to be mistreated in so many different ways by living this life. But right here in this boat, right here in this boat at this moment is a chance to skip all of that torture and go straight to the good times. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that. They understood if the king threw them into that fire, there's a few seconds of scary stuff and then reward. I talk big, don't I? It's hard to live up to what I know. It's hard for me to live like I really believe that this is the truth. But trust me, folks, trust this, not me, trust this. When we read about these men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, let's take the best from them. Let's don't take the worst from Peter. Let's don't take the worst from the people around us. They're hypocrites. They're not hypocrites because God told them to be. They're not hypocrites because they're taught to be that in the scriptures. We're hypocrites because we do not follow this. Because at times we lose our faith and we do the wrong thing. Let's take the best from every example that we have in here. And let's be better than the competition. Competition. 
is the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Is what the devil's trying to get us to do every day, and that is turn against each other. That is to do something that's going to ruin this harmony that we have in Christ. To do something to make us not want to favor one another. I read, I read about how the Lord Jesus kept on, kept on, kept on, kept on teaching these men. And time after time, he would show them. I want you to go to chapter 16 now, or chapter 15 of Matthew. Let's read one more. This is after Jesus walks on the water. This is after Jesus fed 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. In verse 32 of chapter 15, Jesus called his disciples and said, I feel compassion for the people. What was he motivated by? Almost always, it's Jesus feeling for people. He says, I feel compassion for the people because They have remained with me now for three days and have had nothing to eat. I'd say these people have demonstrated their willingness to sit and listen to the Lord. Three days without eating. And they said, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a large crowd? And I'm thinking, where were you last week? What is with you guys? You know, it's easy for me to see their flaws. But how many times has the Lord rescued me? I I can't even tell you. I can't tell you how many times he has rescued me. And I still do the same thing. Where am I going to get the... So I can't sit here, stand here, and criticize these men because they forgot. Because I do it all the time. I'm asking you to help me and let's help each other not to forget. Not to forget what the Lord has done for us. Not to forget the stories. That's not a right, that's not a good word. Stories sounds like it might be fiction. Let's don't forget the historical accounts of things that have happened in the past. Because I want you to, I want to leave you with one thought. You know, if you don't have this, there's not much hope. I want you to turn to Ephesians, the first chapter. And I want to read something from there because the Apostle Paul, in the one place that he spent more time than any other place, the church at Ephesus. If this is written strictly to the church at Ephesus, I want you to think about this. He spent three years here preaching and teaching And here's what he says in verse 15. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. It's knowledge of Jesus that's going to give them this. I pray. He's going to pray for three things. We've talked about this before. Try to put this to memory. I pray that the eyes of your heart, number one, will be enlightened so that you will know this one thing here. That is, what is the hope of His calling? What is is the hope of God's calling us? I want you to know, number two, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And the third thing, and I want you to know what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. I want you to know the power that he had to turn water to wine. I want you to know the power that he had to say to the sea, be still, and everything just calms down. I want you to know the power that God has to say, Come out of the grave. And Lazarus came out. 
I want you to know the power that he has to say, be gone to an evil spirit, and it flees from that person. Healing a lame man that's been lame for 40 years. All of those things that demonstrate that he can feed us from now until whenever. And have more left over after it's done than he did before he started. That's the power that our God has. So what are we afraid of losing by following him? By continuing to follow him? By not giving up? By not falling prey to the fears? The common ordinary fears that everybody in this world has. We of all people should recognize that we with God are invincible. We're bulletproof. The worst that a bullet or a sword can do to us is put us in reward mode immediately, bypassing any further misery that comes our way. If we could just recognize that immortality that we are guaranteed by the power that Jesus had to do everything that he did. What are you afraid of losing? If you're subject this morning to the gospel call, would you make your life right today? Would you come to Jesus as we sing the song of invitation?